So, hi everyone, my name is Evie. Thank you, Lisa, for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, I'm the Abbey Dietitian at St. Mark's Hospital, and I'm here to talk to you about um, diet uh, with internal pouches. So, oh, okay. so what we're going to um, speak about today is some of the nutritional issues that occur with the uh, uh, pouch formation, dietary advice for patients with a newly formed pouch, health eating advice for, pa for patients with an established pouch, um, go through individual foods and how they affect their pouch function and then finish off with um, pouch dysfunction uh, conditions such as pouchitis. So for a pouch to be formed, uh, the colon is removed. And as we all know, the colon is responsible for reabsorbing water and salt. Therefore, the stool becomes a lot more liquid and uh, higher in volume. The pouch is also formed from the last 30 to 60 centimetres of the terminal island, which is the last bit of the, of the small bowel. And the terminal island is responsible for absorbing uh, vitamin B12. Um, because the colon is removed, and that tends to uh, help the reabsorption of water and, and salt, within the first six, six to eight weeks, um, <coughs> there would be considerable losses of fluid and salt, up to two litres per day. After this time, after the initial six to eight weeks, the body does adapt, so the kidneys adapt to conserve water and sodium, and there's also an increased absorption in the ileum, and then losses eventually uh, go down. So on average, people will empty their pouch approximately three to seven times per day, passing uh, approximately 650 grams of stool per day of sort of mushy consistency. Now, um, the ability of the small bowel to digest and absorb nutrients um, remains, so there's no major nutritional deficiencies that are, to, uh, that are to be expected when a pouch is formed, apart from um, things like vitamin B12, because as we said, um, the terminal, some part of the terminal alum is used to form the pouch, and that's where vitamin B12 is absorbed. So, and some studies do, su do suggest that um, vitamin B12 might be um, not properly absorbed. And so it's important to be screened for B12 deficiency and get supplementation if required. Also, bile acid absorption may be reduced and bile acids are involved in the digestion absorption of fats and that could potentially lead to uh, fat malabsorption. Um, as the pouch adapts, um, the long-term aim is to maintain good health by taking a varied uh, and balanced diet to try and prevent nutritional deficiencies, maintain good pouch function and also maintain a healthy weight. And it's important to um, remember to take enough fluid and salt intake to make up for the losses. Sorry about that. <laughs> if your pouch is newly formed, uh, try and introduce food gradually, starting with a soft, low fibre diet that is easy to digest, to try and prevent blockages and avoid disturbing the internal surgical wound. So uh, for the initial two to four weeks um, after the surgery, try and avoid things that are difficult to digest like nuts, seeds, pips, pits, uh, fruit and vegetable skins, peas, sweet corn, mushrooms that are quite fibrous, uh, stingy vegetables like celery, dried fruit, mangoes, pineapples. After that period, after the initial two to four weeks, reintroduce food slowly and just ensure that fibrous foods are, are chewed very well because that helps the breakdown process. Now, in the uh, post-operative uh, period, when you're still recovering from surgery, try and choose high energy and protein foods to promote healing and prevent uh, weight loss. But if you're struggling with poor appetite, try eating little and often throughout the day because small and frequent meals may be easier to manage uh, and make sure that you're eating plenty of protein and energy rich foods and also choose uh, high energy snacks between most to make sure you get enough calories in. Remember that fluid is another way of getting nutrition into you. So try having nourishing <coughs> drinks like milky drinks or smoothies rather than tea and coffee that could potentially fill you up without necessarily giving you a lot of um, calories. Uh, <coughs> make sure that you're getting adequate fluid and salt intake, as we mentioned before, aiming for 1.5 to 2 litres of fluid per day and adding extra salt to meals 
uh, approximately one teaspoon added to food during the course of the day is sufficient to uh, cover for your losses. It's important to watch your hydration levels, particularly in uh, hot weather. Things like a dry mouth or a headache can often be an indicator of um, becoming dehydrated and the colour of your urine is also a good indicator. If you're, if you're passing a dark concentrated urine, that's an indicator that you're probably getting dry. If you become dehydrated, try not to drink lots and lots of fluid which could make the problem worse and, and uh, flash things out of the system. In that situation, that might be the need to consider antidiarrheal medication or things like or oral rehydration solutions such as the Senmax electrolyte mix which is a salty solution that has the right concentration of uh, glucose and, and uh, sodium that helps keep fluid and salt in the body rather than flushing it out. Now, once the pouch adapts, the aim is to follow a healthy, varied and balanced diet based on the different food groups to get all the essential nutrients that we need. Carbohydrate is the main energy source, so it's the carbohydrate is the first fuel our body is going to use to do the everyday activities that we do. And uh, sources of carbohydrate include things like bread, pasta, potatoes, cereal, grains, um, and it's important to uh, have sufficient carbohydrate in the diet to get enough energy. Protein is needed for growth and repair and also for wound healing. Uh, protein sources include meats, lentils, pulses, eggs, nuts, seeds and um, meat alternatives. Um, fat is a more concentrated energy source. We still need it in the diet because it has a, a role in immunity, protects organs and um, also helps the absorption of fat soluble vitamins. Um, but we need it in smaller amounts than the rest of the food groups. Fruit and vegetables provide fibre, vitamins and minerals and antioxidants to help uh, prevent damage in the body. So again, it's important to have, try and aim for your five portions a day uh, with the fruit and vegetables that you're able to tolerate based on your pouch function. Milk and dairy uh, provide calcium for strong bones and teeth as well as uh, vitamins and minerals. Unfortunately, many people with um, stomas and pouches are um, unnecessarily advised to avoid milk, cheese and, and other dairy products. But it's actually only a problem for about one in five people and even then generally most people can tolerate some amounts of, of dairy products. And just remember that dairy foods provide an abundant supply of, of calcium and it's important to try and aim for your th three portions in a day and a portion is glass of milk, a matchbox size of cheese or a, a small pot of yogurt. So try and mix and match to get your, your three portions a day. In. Now with um, regards to alcohol, <laughs> so excess alcohol consumption should be avoided. Try and take alcohol in moderation and the recommendation is up to 21 units a week for men, 14 units a week for women and always try to have one to two alcohol free days per week and a unit equals to half a pint of beer, a pub measure spirit or a small glass of wine which is about 75 mils, not the 200 mils that we get <laughs> with the dinner. With uh, regards to individual foods and pouch function, uh, it's important to remember that individual tolerances will vary considerably. So try and identify on a trial and error basis the foods that you tolerate best yourself. Um, Again, try and eat a varied and well-balanced diet based on the eat well plate that we've seen earlier and only avoid foods that are causing unpleasant symptoms for you. Try to avoid unnecessary restrictions. Um, introduce one new food at a time to be able to identify the level of tolerance you have to that particular food. And remember that tolerances to, to certain foods might change over time. So if, for example, uh, you didn't tolerate s something uh, when your pouch was newly formed, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're never going to be able to tolerate it as the pouch adapts. So keep re-challenging yourself with different things as, as your pouch um, becomes more established because you might find that you're, you're now able to tolerate it. 
Food and symptom diaries might be useful, again, to help you to identify food triggers for you and particular um, tolerances and intolerances you may have and uh, the actual amounts that cause or not cause problems. Oops. Now, um, there's some particular foods that affect uh, pouch function. So some foods help to thicken the stool up and that includes things like uh, bananas, rice, bread, potatoes, so your starchy foods, pasta. Um, but things like chocolate or raw fruit and vegetables or spicy foods, very hot, fat, fat, fatty foods or um, sugary foods, fruit juices and leafy green vegetables can actually uh, make the output a bit more looser. So this is just to have in mind if you're struggling with a poor um, pouch function. So um, this table sort of summarises the effects that different foods may have in uh, patients with pouches. So we discussed uh, foods that increase or help decrease the stool output. Things like um, spicy foods, nuts, seeds, coconuts, citrus fruits, rock fruit and vegetables might cause anal irritation. So you might need to be a bit mindful of that if you're, you're struggling with uh, irritation. Um, gas producing vegetables like broccoli, sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, onion, garlic, leeks, asparagus, beans, spicy foods, fizzy drinks can increase wind. Um, another thing that's important to remember is um, try not to, if you're, if you're troubled by wind, try not to um, have chew a lot of chewing gum or uh, swallow through a straw because that um, can get extra air in and that can uh, worsen the wind problems. Um, and <coughs> foods like fish, onion and garlic um, and eggs might increase the stool order. Now, um, the eating pattern seems to be affecting the pouch function. With the busy lifestyles we all lead, we often see people you know, who are skipping meals uh, regularly and erratic e eating often means the writing bowel habit. So try and ensure that you include meals or snacks at regular intervals during your day. Also, people have found that the stool output tends to be uh, greatest after the main meal. So if you're um, troubled by poor pouch function, try and follow a, a more regular eating pattern, avoid skipping meals. Experiment with the timing and size of meals. Some people find um, better to have the, their main meal early in the day at lunchtime rather than later in the day and have a lighter meal during the evening. Um, try and avoid eating late at night to prevent emptying pouch overnight. Um, and again, keep a, a diary to evaluate the meal and pouch pattern to be able to identify what works best for you. Now, um, Moving on to uh, pouchitis, this is an acute or chronic inflammation of the pouch <coughs> causing diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, bleeding, incontinence and uh, the incidence has been reported between 15 to 44% of patients with uh, pouches. It's usually treated with a two week course of antibiotics but some people might need to um, stay on it for a bit longer. There is uh, emerging evidence regarding the use of probiotics in pachitis. There is specific strains used, including bifidobacterium, lactobacillus, uh, and streptococcus. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. VSL3 is the sort of strongest antibiotic, uh, probiotic that exists in the market at the, at the moment. It's the most heavily researched probiotic, um, <coughs> especially in pachitis. Um, the recommended dose is between three to six grams a day and evidence shows that using probiotics can prevent initial pouchitis onset after uh, having a pouch formed and it may also uh, prevent relapse of recurrent pouchitis. So it might be something that you want to try if you're um, troubled by pouchitis. So, um, the take-home message is making sure that you adopt a regular eating pattern. You're not leaving long gaps between your meals or skipping meals. Uh, make sure that you eat a varied and well-balanced diet based on the healthy eating principles. Consume your meals slowly and chew your food well, because that helps the breakdown process. Um, and drink plenty of fluids, uh, about two litres a day, and have extra salt, especially during episodes of high output. 
but always uh, have at the back of your mind that if you're troubled by um, severe high output, um, you might get dehydrated and then you might need uh, the electrolyte mix like or an oral hydration solution. So do speak to your doctor or dietitian about that. So in, in, in summary, the long-term aim is to promote a balanced diet to prevent nutritional deficiencies and maintain a healthy weight. Uh, remember that intolerances to certain foods will vary between individuals. So what suits one doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to suit someone else. Um, and specific symptoms could be reduced by avoiding specific foods. But again, that would be very individual and you have to identify it on a trial and, and error basis. Lovely, thank you very much, Abby. Has anybody got any questions for Abby at all? Can you tell anything about psyllium or psyllium? Psyllium husk. Yes. So that's a fibre supplement. Yes. Is it likely to help people with parachutes or is it really only for people with irritable bowel syndrome and have a Not necessarily. And, uh, <laughs> Surprisingly, just bef during the break, um, I had patients that said that it did help them and it did improve. But it, again, it, it would be very individual. So you get so both sides of the spectrum. You get patients that do find a benefit and it helps thicken the stool output and get more bark into the stool. But then you get um, other patients that don't necessarily find any sort of benefit out of that. So it would be, again, a tr you know, on a trial and error basis. Um, trying, trialing it, starting with smaller amounts first and, and seeing how your body responds to it. Do you recommend the way of taking it is that sometimes it's a six of these capsules a day, it's a lot to take. Have you any idea of the dosage you should take? So, uh, normally it comes with instructions, but... Um, six capsules a day, that's why. Uh, that, that's for people with irritable bowel, I think. Yeah. But um, it would depend how much, I guess, how much uh, you're troubled by a poor pouch function or by sort of loose output. But um, you can try using half of that first, see how your body responds, and then progressively, if you, 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 know, if you don't see any benefit, try and get the recommended dose in. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, it's going to work the same for everyone. Thank you very much for the chat we had during lunch hour. The question I was going to ask you was about soy, soy milk. Do you recommend that or not? So, uh, generally, it's, it's definitely, well, it's part of. Yeah. So, part, so if you if you if you found that dairy products generally exacerbate your symptoms, and it's something that particular that, because people find that you know lactose intolerance is an issue, but is not as much of, of an issue as we initially thought. If you do, if you have identified yourself that dairy products generally, you know, cause unpleasant symptoms or or exacerbate your symptoms, then rather than you excluding a whole food group and avoiding dairy completely, using lactose-free alternatives like lactose-free milk or soya-based milk, it's probably the, the right thing to do to make sure that you're still getting the protein and the you know, calcium-enriched products in the diet. That's now for patients, how much fiber do we need? <laughs> That's, yeah, that's a very interesting question. And I guess that would be based on your individual tolerance. Um, a patient that has you know, a normal pouch function is not troubled by lots of diarrhea or loose output. Um, the healthy eating principles apply. So aiming for, you know, for your five portions of fruit and vegetables a day, uh, try and get, um, if you can, you know, whole meal, uh, sort of cereal products and the rest of it. But in, in patients where they're troubled by lots of, you know, loose output or diarrhea or um, increased bowel frequency, having lots and lots of fiber in that situation might actually make the, the situation worse. So um, that's why there's not a set recommendation for pouch patients. It, it would be based on your individual tolerance of 
of um, how much you can actually cope with. But does it have the same purpose? Uh, well, so it's as part of a healthy, balanced diet. Yes, because it's part, you know you need all the different food groups to get all the essential nutrients, and and fiber does help to regulate the bowel habit. So uh, if if your pouch function is acceptable, and you're able to tolerate fiber, because that would mean that you get it from your fruit and vegetables. So that would mean that you're also getting your vitamins and minerals, and so you're not excluding complete food groups. But in situations where you really struggling with you know diarrhea and increased bowel frequency that's when you need to be a bit more careful and potentially having a lot of fiber might not be the best thing in that stage Okay. Um, I can't take the lactose, so my dairy intake is very low. Mm -hmm. Have you any thoughts about the almond milk? It, again, it would be whatever patients, you know, it would be based on patient preference and tolerance. But what we're, as dietitians, what we're concerned about is making sure that patients are not excluding complete food groups out of the diet. And they're, you know, if they find something unacceptable in terms of their symptoms, that they then replace it with a suitable alternative. If you are not able to tolerate dairy, making sure that you're getting, whether that's soya milk or lactose-free milk or almond milk, as long as, you know, it's enriched with calcium, um, it will still give you, uh, it will still be a source of protein. So that's, that's absolutely fine. It's whatever, pa some people can, you know, might not like the taste of, how soya milk tastes or how lactose free milk tastes. So, you know, it's, it's trying the range that is out there of the suitable alternatives and finding the one that suits you. Okay. 